Welcome back to another volume of Truly Disturbing Tales from Reddit. Today we're going to be narrating three new unsettling stories taken directly from the platform. I encourage you all to sit back, grab a snack, and enjoy these terrifying personal accounts. Now, without any further delay, let's jump right in. I was just fresh off of a major split up when some friends of mine encouraged me to use Tinder. After witnessing my friend use it himself, I decided to give it a go. What could go wrong is what I thought. I spent hours on end swiping and swiping. Some matched, some didn't. It was fun for the most part. And then swiped on Linda. And then I swiped on Linda. Another match. A decision that I'd soon end up regretting. We spoke for a few weeks on and off and got to know each other. She seemed like a nice enough girl. She was a bit older than me, yet looked a whole lot younger. She wasn't fussed about going out for a meal or a trip to the movies or anything traditionally romantic, so we arranged to meet up at a bar instead. At first glance, she was barely recognizable from her profile picture. She looked a lot older, and had clearly gained a lot of weight. Already the first red flag was starting to show, although that wasn't a major problem. We got our drinks and got into some good conversation we seemed to have a lot in common. Maybe too much, even. My instincts on the matter? I had the impression that she perhaps did some research on me somehow and was trying her best to impress me. There came a point of silence, awkward silence, where I did my best to think up something to say to kind of break the ice. But she beat me to it. Let's talk about sex, she said. I was too stunned to get my head around at how forward and straight to the point she was. She asked me about my sex life and what stuff I'd gotten up to with my previous partners. We exchanged our stories, and to be honest, mine didn't sound half as exciting as hers. Hers were rather dramatic. So I just made stuff up. I had never felt comfortable talking about this to someone, let alone on a first date. It was at this point that she would reveal something to me that made me sick to my stomach. She told me that she liked bondage, and that she liked to torture and abuse people just for the fun of it. One story in particular that she shared, she said that she tricked a man into getting into bed with her, and just how shocked he was to lie down on a bed full of thumbtacks. At this point, I was quickly slurping my drink, thinking up all the excuses I needed, ready to leave. Then, she shared with me her final story. She told me that about a week before meeting me, she'd met another man from Tinder. She got him to take her to his own flat. She said she was well prepared and had a bag full of items in her car, what she would call bondage tools. To my horror, she told me that after encouraging this poor bloke to drop the vanilla stuff and engage in a little adventure with her, he followed her lead. He laid down on his bed, fully nude in anticipation of her joining him, only to have her approach him with a roll of clear cling wrap. When he asked what that was for, she simply said, Don't you worry, this will be fun. She proceeded to wrap him from head to toe in this wrap, leaving just a hole for his nose to protrude from, over and over again, around and around his body, to the point where he was practically mummified. Once she was satisfied with her work, she just left him there, wrapped snugly, with no way to free himself from his plastic wrap restraints. As she finished the story, she laughed as she mimicked his mumbles, which were surely pleased for help. She shrugged her shoulders and said, He's probably dead by now, as she chuckled and finished off her drink. At this point, I decided that it was time to leave. No further point to talking, or staying for that matter. I didn't even want to question if that was some sadistic joke or not. I just stood up and started to leave. That's when she went to grab my arm and pull me in for a kiss. With the reflexes of a cat, I swerved her so smoothly that she nearly fell off the bar stool, giving me the freedom to turn and leave. 
which I did without hesitation. From the time that I left the bar up until a few days after, I got a series of messages from Linda, asking me why I'd left and didn't I want to play with her, all of which I ignored. The final message that I got read, probably for the better, I would have left you cuffed to your bedposts without an extra thought about it. Safe to say, I never met Linda again, and I hope that I never will. To preface this story, I'm a paramedic, and I have been for the last 10 years. Working in emergency medicine, you get to see the weirdest and the worst of people, so it's not too uncommon for these types of stories to exist. However, in my 10 years, I have never experienced pure terror incarnate like I had about six years ago. I will not be revealing specific or identifying details, but trust that even without those, this story is plenty horrifying on its own. About six years ago, I moved to another city for work. I worked for a 911 ambulance service that responded to calls in the city as well as the country, which had a few other small towns. The city itself was not large, probably less than 100,000 people. Working for that service required working 24-hour shifts. It wasn't particularly busy. Maybe you'd get 5 to 10 calls in 24 hours and generally get some decent sleep at night. This city was a pretty rough place as the oil industry had boomed there, which drew all sorts of folk from around the country to work in the oil fields nearby. One night in January, me and my partner, who was an EMT basic, received a call in the next town over. It was around 2 a.m. when the call came out, and the only information we had was that a person in an apartment called 911 after hearing the downstairs neighbor screaming for help. We responded emergent, as the details were very limited. When we arrived on scene, police and fire department were already there, and we were getting ready to make entrance into the building with them. The person who had called 911 was there and told us which apartment she heard the screaming coming from. We attempted to pound on the door at first to get the resident to come to the door. When no one answered, the fire department got ready to spread the door and make entry. Luckily, the landlord showed up and gave us keys to get into the unit. As we opened the door, that's when the creepiness began. The apartment itself was pitch black, not a single light, as if no one was home. Police entered first, and with our flashlights, we followed. Looking around the apartment, the kitchen and dining room looked like a hoarder's nest. I'm not exaggerating when I say there were literally five foot tall mountains of garbage, food, and dishes in the kitchen, and the same in the living room, only this time with magazines, clothes, and garbage. This meant there was only a very narrow walkway to navigate the entire apartment. Officers proceeded down the hallway ahead, where the bedroom and bathroom were located. One of the officers stopped at the bathroom door as there was a light shining from underneath. The officer opened the door and just stood in the hallway. With a flat tone, he said, she's in here. I walk in first to the bathroom. The first thing I notice is the peculiarity of the light in the bathroom. It's a very pale yellow light coming from a single bulb on the ceiling, similar to those old heat lamps that used to be common in bathrooms. The light gave off an odd vibe, as it was just so unnatural. The next thing I noticed is the lack of anything in the bathroom. No floor mats, no toilet cover, no towels, no knickknacks, just nothing, empty, except the vanity, which contained the sink. On top, in the bowl of the sink, were approximately 20 to 30 makeup bottles piled up. Some were opened and leaking causing there to be powders and liquids everywhere. The last thing that I noticed was the body of an elderly woman lying naked in the tub. As I walk closer, I can see her lying on her side, nearly in the fetal position. Her skin was pale, 
and there was about eight inches of water in the tub. Looking at her face, her eyes are closed, and her head is against the bottom of the tub with her mouth and nose completely submerged under the water. My partner steps up behind me. He suggests that we just call the coroner and inform them of the body. Two officers pile into the bathroom behind my partner so that there are four of us in this tiny bathroom with me next to the lady in the tub. With me being who I am, I decide to do my due diligence and at least make sure that the lady is actually deceased. I kneel down next to the tub and reach my arm in, put my fingers on her neck, attempting to check for a carotid pulse. In an instant, without warning or the slightest hint of movement, the woman springs up out of the tub with the agility and speed of a feral cat. The only reaction I was able to manage was to just stand up as quickly as possible, and I stood there just staring at her. She stared right back at me, eyes wide as could be, before she began screaming at me. She attempted to cover herself with her hands as best as she could while sitting in the water still. I quickly look around and notice everyone else who was in the bathroom with me had bolted out of there, not a single soul in sight. I try to steal myself and try calming the lady down, telling her who I was and why I was there. She denied ever screaming and told me she does this every morning as she has some kind of joint condition and soaking in warm water helps ease her joint pain. Now, at this point, I have my doubts and I have to question this woman's sanity. I question her regarding self-harm and address what potentially could be interpreted as suicidal behavior, but she denies all of it. The next step is to determine her mental capacity to ensure she's in the right frame of mind to make responsible and appropriate decisions. She answers all my other questions appropriately, and at this point, per the law, she's able to refuse any and all care as she is mentally sound. I ask her if she will at least allow me to check her vitals so that I can be sure she is healthy and I can add it to my report. She vehemently refuses and tells me to get out of her house, which she has every right to do. I acknowledge and have her sign a refusal of service form. As I leave the bathroom, my partner, the two officers that were in the bathroom with me, along with two other officers and firefighters that were waiting in the apartment, are just staring at me with eyes wide and gaping mouths, speechless. I don't say a word, and we all leave the apartment. Once we all got outside, I had the most uneasy, uncontrolled fit of laughter. My partner and the officers started laughing too. My partner told me later that all he remembers is seeing her move and hearing me say, oh fuck, which I don't even remember saying and then the rest of the party running out of the bathroom. I wish I could say I never saw this lady again, but that would just be untrue. Like I said, after this call, I was able to laugh about it once my heart stopped racing. I figured I would never have to see this woman again, and just that alone gave me comfort. I told the story several times to family, friends, and coworkers, just because of the sheer shock value. This part of the story I've only told to a couple of people because most probably can't stomach it. So be warned, this will contain some graphic content. About three months after the first call with the bathtub lady, I'm working with another EMT basic partner. Not the same one as before, but he is well aware of the story. So the day is going by like normal and nightfall comes. I'm hoping to get some sleep as generally night is a little calmer. Each of our stations have a few bedrooms with twin beds to allow us to at least sleep somewhat comfortably. I take off my boots and lay down to doze. I always keep my radio turned way up and by my head so I can wake up if we get a call. Sure enough, tones drop on the radio and I wake up. Looking at the clock, it's about 4 a.m. Radio traffic requests the ambulance for a welfare check on an individual who has not been seen for a while. Both me and my partner get up, put our boots on, and start responding to the address. As we get closer, I start recognizing the area. Before I even see the building, I tell my partner, I swear to God, if it's the same lady, he just laughs 
and we continue on our way. As we pull up on the scene, sure as sh- same f-ing building. At this point, my heart starts to race again. A few officers were already on the scene. As I get out of the ambulance, one of the officers comes up and tells me, the lady we're here for has a friend that works at the gas station nearby. The friend told 911 that the lady usually comes and visits him every day, but the friend hasn't seen the lady in several weeks now. The officer also tells me that there's an odor coming from inside the apartment complex. If you work in EMS or have been around such, you know what that means. If not, then I won't spoil it just yet. I asked the officer if she's familiar with this person or has heard the story of the last encounter with her. The officer tells me that she's not, but her two co-workers behind her were on the original call with me and are just smiling, but not saying a word. I tell the officer who the person is and our last run-in with her. The officer just raises her eyebrow a bit and says, okay. So we approach the apartment complex yet again. As I open the main door, you can immediately smell the odor permeating throughout the entire complex. We walk downstairs to the door of this lady's apartment. I bang on it a few times and shout, ambulance. No response. Officers bang on the door. No response. We try to get a hold of the landlord again to give us access, but he's unavailable. Over the radio, I request the fire department and request that they bring the door spreader. The fire department arrives and they come downstairs to set up the door spreader. If you don't know a door spreader, it's a tool that the fire department places between the two door jams and uses a lever to start pressing the door jams apart freeing the latch from the door frame so you can make entrance. As they finally get the door open, that awful wafting smell spills out of the apartment. Same thing as last time. Pitch black, piles of garbage all around, though this time it's a bit different because there are thousands of flies buzzing around. Again, the officers enter first with us following with our flashlights. One of the male officers gets down the hallway to the bathroom and opens the door. He looks back at me, shakes his head no, and continues forward. My EMT partner, who is pretty new, is right behind me. I turn to him and tell him to wait in the hallway and then I'll let him know if I need him. I was trying to be nice and to spare him. The officer continues down the hallway toward the bedroom. At this point, the anxiety is increasing because now... We are in uncharted territory, and once again, I have no idea what we are going to find here. The officer eventually makes it to the bedroom. I see him shine his light into the bedroom, then uses the bend of his elbow to cover his mouth and nose. That's when he waves me over. As I walk to him, the smell only gets stronger. I peer in the bedroom with my flashlight, and that's when I see her. The bedroom is set up so the bed is right in the middle of the room with the head pressed against the wall. So there is some space on either side and at the foot of the bed. Or at least, there would be if her floors weren't filled up to the height of the bed with clothes, magazines, books, food, and garbage. At the foot of the bed are two large four-foot tall piles of random shit that at the base are probably about four feet in diameter. I know it's hard to visualize, but picture two large, conical-shaped mounds side by side at the foot of the bed. In the tiny space between the two huge mounds and the foot of the bed lies bathtub lady. Stunned for a moment, I stand there next to the officer and just look. This is the part that gets grotesque. Bathtub lady is lying perfectly on her back, with her arms folded up and crossed in front of her like you would see a skeleton doing in the movies. Bathtub lady's skin looks almost like paper. It's dried out and shrunken, turning black and rotting. The level of decomposition from her is one that I hadn't seen before. Her hip bones were visible where the skin had cracked and receded. Her kneecaps were coming through her skin. A few ribs were just barely visible poking through the skin on the sides of her upper abdomen. And her hair was beginning to fall out. Her lips were all but gone. Her eyes were gone. I got a bit closer to look, 
All I kept thinking was, if you wake up, this officer is probably going to draw and shoot you in the head. I walked a little bit closer, saw that she was almost perfectly preserved, like a mummy. There was absolutely nothing left of her eyes, with the exception of maggots crawling around in the sockets. From behind me, I hear a couple quiet, muffled gags, and that's when I walk back out to my partner. I tell him, sorry man, but we need the body bag, and I need your help. Everyone walks outside to get some fresh air. The officer that was in the bedroom with me gagged a few more times outside, but luckily held himself together and didn't vomit. The one good thing about this is we had recently been given these really nice PAPR respirators from FEMA for a recent Ebola outbreak. My partner grabbed the body bag and I grabbed the PAPRs. We put on our gear and walked back inside. The officer that was with me, like a f***ing champ, came back inside as well without a respirator and held the flashlight for us. Me and my partner had to spend 10 minutes just clearing out all the trash so we had enough room to put the body bag down next to bathtub lady. Once we had enough room, that's when the sketchy part came. If you've never seen a body with that amount of decomposition, I can tell you, it's very brittle. We attempted to move her as carefully as we could as to not break anything. However, when we attempted to move her, she was stuck. I couldn't figure out what was going on. I was at the head, my partner was at the feet trying to move her. I put my arms down her back and neck to support the head so it didn't just break off. I got down to look as I lifted to see what we were getting stuck on. As I lifted, I saw, but it was already too late. As I lifted, the skin on her back was stuck to the carpet. So as I lifted further, it started peeling off her ribs and spine. We had no other choice as we were unable to cut the carpet at this time. As we lifted her up, all of the skin came off of her back and stayed stuck to the floor, almost like some sick chalk outline, which is when I saw it. What seemed to be like a thousand maggots crawling around on the inside of her skin, between the skin and her back. We moved her gently into the bag, luckily not breaking anything. We got the bag out and into the ambulance, where we would then transport her to the funeral home with all of our windows rolled down and emergent, so we wouldn't have to stay in the ambulance any longer than humanly possible. So that's my story about Bathtub Lady, and believe me, I'm sorry for all the details. Best we can figure is that she likely passed shortly after our initial visit out to her apartment, due to how long she had obviously been in that spot. What chills me even more is the idea that we may have been the last people to see her alive before she left this world. I don't know if it would have changed a thing if she opted to let us check her out that time, but it's still very hard for me not to wonder. When I was in my very early 20s, I lived in some pretty shitty apartments that were known for being a little sketchy for the area. This happened in the United States, by the way. There was this neighbor that always seemed to be listening to James Brown and Motown, so even though he seemed a bit off, I thought, how could he be that weird if he's chilling to some old school music? I'd hear him blast his music and have louder conversations, but then again, we both had studio apartments that were touching, so... I just would play music to not hear his so loudly. One night, he was drinking a lot and had his girlfriend around. You could hear him getting belligerent, but nothing that seemed out of the ordinary for him, I suppose. It wasn't too late, so I headed out for the night with some friends of mine while my boyfriend at the time stayed in. I got dropped off at home around 1am or so, and as we were driving into the parking lot from afar, we see my neighbor outside in between cars looking sort of odd. Okay, weird. Whatever. This guy is just kind of creepy that way anyway. At that point, my friends were more weirded out than I was, but I didn't think much of it and had them drop me off near the entrance because it would be easier for them to leave that way. That was until they drove away and I walked up to go into my apartment, which I had to pass his first. I swear, my heart dropped 
because he was standing still by then, with his body hidden by the bush that's between our apartments. Like the funny Homer Simpson meme, but actually not funny whatsoever, because as I approached, it seemed like he thought maybe I didn't see him because it was so dark out, and he was standing as still as a statue. I waved and mumbled hi because I freaking see you, and I'm not going to pretend that I don't at this point, so don't even try anything. At that point, after acknowledging he was there, he stepped out from the side of the bush and came into the dim porch light. And never in my life have I looked into eyes like that. My heart is racing as I tell this. They were widened, dark, fully dilated, just like you'd expect a wild animal to be. Almost lunatic, if I were to express his energy as well. He didn't say anything, but he did give me a bone-chilling look, and I scampered off into my apartment immediately. My boyfriend was drowsy since it was late, but he did say the neighbor's music was loud and continued for some time, and he heard a ton of noise and arguing earlier in the night, but didn't think much of it. That evening, all night, we heard thumps, and it just sounded like furniture was moving. It weirded me out even more knowing that he was awake in that state that I had viewed him in, which seemed almost primal. The next morning, I wake up and I hear cops outside banging on his door, and was partially relieved to see them, but then super scared of why they were there in the first place. They took him away in handcuffs shortly after demanding to be let in, and asked me the last time I had talked to or seen the neighbor. I told them about the night before, the arguing, noises, and the frightening encounter that he hit me with when I got home. What I found out during the next day will forever make my stomach turn. I was told this from the groundskeeper of our building, and the details I'll keep simple since it was rather horrendous. The Motown James Brown listening neighbor had brutally murdered his girlfriend that night, dismembered parts of her, and dragged the rest of her body near the train tracks which were directly behind our apartments. It hit me that the cold, primal, and wide-eyed look that I had seen on that man's face was that of a person who had just taken another human being's life, in such a vicious, disgusting way at that. I felt utterly terrible for this woman, who did not deserve to go out like that. She was always quiet and sweet, and seemed a bit down on her luck, usually asking me for cigarettes when I encountered her. To this day, my heart aches thinking about how close I was to death, quite literally, and how he could have ambushed me out of insanity since he was just waiting in the darkness when I walked up. To all of you who get that intuition or gut feeling, listen to it. If you have a bad feeling about someone, even if they seem harmless, stay a safe distance from them. I moved into a different apartment right after this because it was too much thinking about what had happened. How someone was murdered no more than six inches beyond a wall from where I laid my head at night. That neighbor went to jail, and I saw his booking photo, which was so damn scary to see. I don't know about court or trials or anything like that. I just hope this man stays behind bars. Because that is where he truly belongs.